Alrighty guys, welcome to the Bigfoot Researcher's Journal. Today we are in deep North Carolina looking at Bigfoot. Check this guy out, man. Absolutely incredible. Again, with the embedded in the incline bank where there's like a little uh, split. You know, they, they've been digging in right there, apparently. And, uh, and as you can see, the footage is incredible, man. Look at that guy. Smile, big boy. If you're interested in learning more in-depth study material about the Sasquatch, join us on Patreon at Crypto Reality. the first time that you became aware that there was possible Sasquatch activity on your property? Um, let me just kind of go back in time um, from this point. Let's say maybe a little over two years ago, I started noticing uh, just some activity or sets of activities that seemed to have a common source, uh, got my attention. Uh, maybe some things that I've been experiencing for years attributed to maybe bears or coyotes or raccoons or whatever else is out in the woods suddenly it became apparent that um, these, were, these were some activities or some characteristics or things that uh, maybe a bear wouldn't engage in or a bear wouldn't be, uh, w wouldn't be typical for, for bear activity to, to, uh, to, to be able to explain away. Or, you know, uh, hearing things be, being thrown, I mean, something's got to have a thumb, something's obviously got to have some intent. Uh, you start hearing things like, um, your tree shaking uh, when you're outside working in the evening outside the house. Um, you know, you, you just you start asking people who lived around here all their life. You know, what what could do this? What would shake a tree to like get your attention at night? Or what kind of animal would hang out with you outside your house at night? Or would a bear do this? Or would a coyote do this? Or what do you know around here that'll do this? And you, the answer always came up the same: nothing. Uh, we don't. That's not a bear. A bear wouldn't do that. A coyote wouldn't do that. A raccoon wouldn't do that. A fox wouldn't do that. So once you start to eliminate what it's not, it's like what's left, or you end up with an unknown. Um, I, I got the feeling on many occasions outside the house at night that I was hearing something rolling a log over, and I thought well, maybe there's a bear you're looking for grubs or salamanders tearing a log open or rolling it over looking for something to eat. Um, and, and I would hear this noise that sounded like something rolling a log over for, for years. And uh, at some point, of course, after I began to question, you know, maybe what was, was making some of these noises or responsible for some of this activity, uh, it became obvious to me that it would have to be the same barrel and the same log in the same circumstance because the, no the noise really never changed. So I began to question, well, maybe it's not a bear rolling log over. Um, I know on a few occasions, uh, about two years ago, what really got my activity was things like um, experiencing growling from something I couldn't see in a rhododendron thicket, say at four o'clock in the afternoon and, and, or a summer day, uh, still good light outside. Uh, this thing or these things sounded close enough to where you should be able to see the source of what's growling at you, which was a little odd. It was really odd. Um, things like uh, what appeared or what sounded like hammering or knocking of some sort, like something 
with a thumb, a person in the woods at a road dinner thinking, banging on something when you know there's nobody in there. I mean, I live in a pretty remote area. I, you know, I've lived in the same house for 20 years. I know the woods. Uh, typically, you, you can see a person if a person's down there beating on something. If a person's growling at you, if a bear's growling at you, you can see a bear. Um, it gets to the point where you start to question your own sanity you know, after a while. It's like, you know, I'm experiencing something that I should not be experiencing. Uh, what's going on? Like something that seems distinctly mammalian, a mammal, uh, something with a large diaphragm making a very loud growling or, or grunting noise, maybe even mumbling noises occasionally at night or sound like groups of people mumbling in the woods. You hear things like tree shaking, have stuff being thrown at you, something's got a, a opposable th opposing thumb, something can grasp something, use a tool perhaps. I mean, these are things that, that the only animal that I know of that's not inherently afraid of people and will hang out with you at night, not only hang out, but sometimes get closer and come in closer and closer as you're working to the point to kind of freak you out a little bit. The only animal I know of like that is human, is a, the human animal. So once you eliminate that, I mean, once again, what's left? You know, are, are, are you losing your mind? I mean, are you experiencing something that you shouldn't be experiencing? Who knows? All I can say is, um, you know, once I started really paying attention to what was going on around me, I can honestly say that uh, the possibility for something like a Bigfoot or Sasquatch to exist became uh, not only possible, but, but, but extremely likely. One morning, um, I had been looking out the window, and, and where I live sometimes it just, it, I've had other people comment, visitors, friends that have come by, comment on how surreal the woods can seem at times, and I would tend to agree. Sometimes, I don't know if it's the way the light shines through the woods, or maybe the, the way that uh, some mornings in the summer, maybe whenever, kind of misty, and they just look kind of odd. But I was looking at the office window one morning, and I thought, gosh, if I'm ever going to see this weird thing that's going on, this uh, maybe Sasquatch or whatever it is out there, you know, today has got to be it. And so, once again, I was staring out the window for probably, what, 10, 15 minutes, and I thought, you know, I, I'm not going to waste a day staring out the window for something I'm probably not going to see. So I get up, and I go in the kitchen, and I start to pour water in, in the coffee kettle or to, you know, put on the stove to make coffee with. And as I'm filling the kettle, I happen to glance out the kitchen window and about 200 feet um, to my west, I see a tall upright figure moving down across my field of view very quickly, very smoothly, looks to be uh, dark, dark gray, kind of a charcoal gray, upright. Uh, later, judging by the foliage that's between me and this upright animal, uh, looks to be maybe seven or eight feet tall, um, monochromatic, it doesn't appear to have clothes on, it appears to be furry. And I'm giving you a lot of detail here for, for a, a sighting, what I'll say is a sighting that only lasted a second, it, it might, maybe a split second. It, it was short enough for me to, of course, immediately question what I saw after it happened. Um, but then I started thinking, well, that's probably natural. You know, you've been experiencing something, you've been wondering what you've been experiencing for going on a, probably a year and a half then, and suddenly you see what bears out what you think you may see one day, and you're like, man, did I really see that, <laughs> you know? And, and But I can honestly say that I saw what I saw. Now, what it was, I, I can't tell you. It, it looked like what people call a Sasquatch, but now what a Sasquatch is, I, I can't say. I'm looking at everything that's going on up here in uh, so I'm looking at everything that's going on up here in North Carolina so far and what I can tell you is there's something very real first of all going on yesterday we found a track in some ferns Alan and I and um, you know he was astonished by the track I mean if you've been watching the journal then you know we find we find a lot of tracks, and um, and so I wasn't really all that affected by it based on what he was telling me. So what that tells me as a researcher is that um, now we have some corroborative evidence to back up what he's been saying about his house being hit by rocks. And then last night he, you know, told me that it sounds like somebody runs by and slaps the house, which um, is you know disturbing, man. I mean. Uh, I couldn't imagine having to coexist in this close of, uh, of proximity with the Sasquatch species, specifically because 
the nature of the way we we use the environment and and are ever expanding and changing it to accommodate our own needs um whether you it would be a farm or or just a, you know putting a house in um you know we alter the environment to a degree that i think infringes on the way they like to live and i think that this is the type of thing that promotes that type of behavior in a sasquatch species we're infringing on on certain rights that they think they have and and what does that sound like it sounds like us so there's another corollary there between the bigfoot species and and man and it's really fascinating because you know yesterday i had a, ta uh, a chance to meet uh this gentleman robin and um you know at first it was um you know, I think maybe he was a little nervous and, uh, and you know, just an outsider coming in and what was my opinion going to be. And, and uh, but once he settled down and started to talk about his experiences, it was very obvious that, you know, he was under emotional duress and, uh, and that he was suffering some emotional stress about what was happening. And, uh, and it was reflected in his body language and uh, in his posture and uh and then you know the things that he was saying that his candor on the matter was uh you know admirable so i look forward to getting back up there for sure and uh and doing a full interview with him and uh and hopefully we can you know get his thing but from what i hear uh he says king kong's up on the mountain pretty much and that sounds familiar um the bushes are moving outside here Probably a small, there are bears here too. So if you do come up here, you got to be careful, man, because evidently there are black bears uh, apparently that do actually eat you here, which I found fascinating because I never thought a black bear would do that. In the state of Florida, I don't think they, I guess maybe anywhere a bear would eat you, but you just don't see that in, a, in like a black bear thing down in Florida very much. I don't think it really ever uh, I've ever, I've never heard of it. So, but apparently here they do eat people. Uh, I don't know, man. We're gonna see today. Today's Friday, and uh, it's about eight forty-five in the morning, and I'm just waiting for Alan to come. I thought I'd shoot a little bit and let you guys know what was going on. So, anyway, that's it. So it's uh, Friday morning. Yesterday we had a uh, few instances going on where um, we were hearing brush pop all around us. And, uh, you know, I mean, I could have swore I saw something twice up on the hill when we were at Robin's house. And, uh, you know, it looked like it was like kind of moving out and... Just typical uh, Bigfoot activity, or Bigfoot behavior. But um, I didn't, I wasn't filming at the time, so we were just talking and kind of getting to know each other. And then today we're going to go back and shoot an interview. Um, the house is actually beautiful that we're staying in, <laughs> up in the mountains. I was expecting like a like a little cabin and like a real rough stay, but uh, I'm like doing laundry right now, so it <laughs> can't be that bad. So, but uh, it's beautiful up here, man. I highly recommend it. If you're into the, the Bigfoot research thing or the squatching thing, then uh, North Carolina, man, beautiful. Nothing but mountains and, uh, and activity and, and stuff everywhere, so. Meanwhile, the study in South Florida has been yielding incredible results as we've been going over all the footage that we've been shooting for the last 10 years in excess of 50 terabytes of film. This particular footage was shot by a few guests that we had in town with a night vision camera. Check this out. Right here we can see we got this guy here. He's got a bald head and there's some hair hanging right. It comes up right here. This is his eye. It looks like a real old one, man, where his skin's kind of wilting. Man, seeing these things out here while we're researching, is like, look at him, he's blinking and everything in there, man. See that? That's the eye. Watch the ball. Uh-oh. 
nocturnal. I guess he sees pretty good at night. But you can even see hair hanging in this guy's face. And his head comes up. And there's either somebody's hand or something, or this is his head. Bald all the way up. Um, I've seen him with hair lines that are straight across right here. And there's hair all the way up. That's why I say maybe this guy's old. You can see where we're getting like kind of a droop. Where, is I, where you can see the eye. And, uh, and it's interesting because he's definitely blinking. <laughs> Welcome to the Bigfoot Researcher's Journal. So here you can see the subject plainly. And, uh, and what it is, is he's in a ditch, about a three foot depression, right next to the trail. And he's just watching the team. We had researchers all up and down this trail walking past him, looking for Bigfoot. You can see in this frame the, uh, the outline of the bone structure around the eyes. Um, that right eye, you really get a sense of that bone structure. You can see he has a typical man's nose. That's what you can observe. He also appears to possibly have a hand up on the right side of his face. You can if you watch, you can kind of see the tips of the fingers, I think, every now and then. It's almost like he's leaning on his elbow in the ditch, up on the incline, his hand there, his cheekbone. It's typical in this area for this to happen. This is what we've been encouraging in this exact spot for almost nine years now. Um, they come to us, and so when people sit down in this particular area and give them a chance hour hour and a half two hours sitting still in the same spot the creatures crawl right up to you you don't really have a choice great piece of footage um, you know I had a lot of concern about um, you know taking this many people into this area um, I think from a data standpoint it, it paid off um, and we were able to get you know observations like these, this one and the other ones you're you're seeing and have been seeing for a few months now and uh, and it's valuable data especially uh, to continue the research in this spot. Like we know now they'll use this particular ditch. If you post up and, and you, know, you put your chairs out, you sit there, uh, they'll, they'll come in on you in this spot as well. And that's fascinating data because we can use that in our future experimentations. You can really see that guy's eyes in there. He's right up on the edge of that ditch, which is just inside the tree line. So he's leaning on the on the incline. Yeah, you can see right here its its brow is moving, and uh, and its you know its nose is moving with it. It's you know connected right there. You can see it. You can see the balls inside here. If you look, they're inside there. He's staring right at the camera. He's got a few leaves and stuff in his face, but you can see him back in there. It's crazy, man. Look at this right here where you can see the eye. You can see the eye really well right there. It's great. Great piece of footage. Let's take a look. And through this section, you, you can really see the figure of how his head comes up and that he's, he appears to be leaning and then possibly on his elbow there and his hand appears to be up on the side of his face. You can get, you know, real good frames of the fingers individually, slowing it down. This is one of those situations where studying the topography gave us the awareness of the possibilities for where they would approach our group and, and then, you know, we're pointing the cameras in the right directions and monitoring those approaches. And so determining uh, all of that before you go in the field is is really important if you're going to stage one of these kind of like sit-outs where you're you're going to be sitting there for a few hours to, to try to give 
rise to the creature's curiosity about what you're doing in their environment. They're, they're going to approach. Well, study the topography and choose your place carefully because you can actually get them to come in and watch your group if you sit there long enough. And if you've studied the topography, you can catch them on film doing it. The white horse was rescued from the mountains in North Carolina after a serious storm. No one claimed it was missing, and Alan found it where it was being sold after it was rescued. But he bought the horse and brought it back. It's interesting to note from this investigation that I did there in North Carolina that this albino horse was the horse that Alan thinks the Sasquatch, for some reason, chose. Is it coincidence that the Bigfoot we've been studying are also albino? Who knows? But it's interesting.